In this video, we're breaking down two huge questions. How the Death Star was designed in-universe, and whether Elon Musk's SpaceX could even attempt something remotely similar today. We'll start with kyber crystals and planetary lasers, show what the Empire got right and wrong about megastructure engineering, and then move into the hard truth of how reusable rockets and orbital assembly stack up against building a moon-sized space station. By the end, you'll see why physics draws a clear line between sci-fi fantasy and what's really within human reach. Leave a like, subscribe, and let's get into it. The Empire's ultimate weapon wasn't an idea born in a vacuum. Known officially as the DS-1 Orbital Battle Station, it began with schematics first drafted by the Geonosians, before being taken over by the Republic and eventually constructed in secret under Imperial control. From its inception, it was meant to be more than a military project. It was a symbol of the Empire's ability to dominate through fear. Once complete, the Death Star embodied absolute power in a galaxy already consumed by conflict. The defining characteristic of this station was scale. Canon sources put the first Death Star's diameter at around 160 kilometers, an immensity that placed it beyond comparison with anything humanity has ever built. It wasn't just a super weapon, but a mobile world staffed by millions, roughly 1.7 military personnel, supported by 400,000 droids, and almost a quarter of a million civilians and contractors. With multiple docking bays large enough to house star destroyers, whole residential sectors, and agricultural facilities to sustain a population, it operated as a fortress, colony, and doomsday device all at once. Obi-Wan Kenobi's reaction in A New Hope, mistaking it for a moon at first glance, captures exactly how its size overwhelms normal perception. At its heart sat the super laser. What made it distinct from conventional weaponry was its fictional power source, kyber crystals. In Star Wars lore, kybers possess a unique ability to focus and amplify energy. Lightsabers rely on a single crystal to produce a plasma blade. Scaled up, the Death Star's engineers supposedly fused enormous kyber shards into arrays vast enough to direct unimaginable destructive force. Rogue One even shows this process explicitly. Giant kyber crystals harvested and combined to channel power into a single coherent beam. That lore detail explains, within its narrative, how the weapon could release energy far beyond what physics allows. To understand the contrast with real-world engineering, compare it to what we currently have, the International Space Station. The ISS is just over 100 meters end-to-end -end with a mass of 420 tons, and it took decades of launches, assembly, and international cooperation to complete. Against that, the Death Star is orders of magnitude larger than any orbital structure in existence. The logistical and material requirements sit so far past anything achievable that real-world megastructures, from space stations to skyscrapers, seem minuscule in comparison. But not everything about the Death Star was perfection. Galen Erso, one of its chief engineers, was coerced into the project and eventually encoded a deliberate weakness. By subtly misaligning the reactor's core systems, he created a vulnerability that appeared as a tiny exhaust port, insignificant to Imperial designers, but catastrophic under the right circumstances. Fiction frames this as more than technical sabotage. It's a narrative of arrogance. The Empire believed no force would ever uncover such a flaw, and that overconfidence guaranteed their downfall. In terms of logistics, the films and supporting material provide a patchwork explanation. Factory worlds, forced labor, and secret supply chains enabled the assembly of this impossible machine. Within the story, that shorthand is enough to suspend disbelief. It's a way of saying, yes, such a project would demand resources beyond imagination, but in this galaxy, the Empire had the machinery of tyranny to make it happen. What this all reveals is a dichotomy. The Death Star works perfectly in its fictional context, but collapses under scrutiny from real physics. The scale can be described, the population numbers recorded, and the weapons parts inventoried. But the question hangs over everything. Could a beam of energy actually shatter a planet? That is the turning point where narrative magic meets the hard limitations of science. Destroying an entire planet isn't just a spectacle for a movie screen. It's an energy requirement that breaks our sense of scale. The Death Star's signature moment 
That single green super laser blast is described in lore as a beam channeled through massive kyber crystals and amplified until it tears a world apart. In universe, the explanation stops there. But if you step into real physics, the numbers aren't just big. They reach into ranges our technology can't even approach. The standard way physicists would frame this problem is through something called gravitational binding energy. That's the amount of energy you'd need to pull apart every atom of Earth so none of them are bound together anymore. Estimates used by physics explainers and cited in the background material put Earth's gravitational binding energy at around 2.2 times 10 to the 32nd joules. That's what it would take to completely disrupt the planet. Written out, you're looking at a 2 followed by 32 zeros. But raw numbers don't mean much unless you compare them to things we already understand. So take humanity's annual energy budget. Many analysis put global consumption in the low 10 to the 20th per year. Every fossil fuel burned, all the electricity from nuclear reactors, rolled together for a full year of civilization's activity. That's still more than a trillion times smaller than the energy needed for one Death Star shot. Even if you ran our entire infrastructure for millions of years, you wouldn't reach the threshold. That's how extreme the gap is. Modern nuclear weapons release about 10 to the 17th joules per detonation. That's a staggering amount compared to anything else we use. But it still doesn't move the needle here. Even multiplying the energy of every nuclear weapon ever built won't get you close. The scale difference isn't a matter of adding more bombs. It's an entirely separate category of energy. So where do you actually find numbers in that range? The comparison that works is the sun. Our star pours out an incomprehensible amount of energy each second. To match the requirement for destroying a planet, you need to capture a significant slice of that stellar output and somehow store or direct it. Put another way, the Death Star's beam implies compressing energy on the scale of stars and discharging it as a weapon. That's why the Star Wars universe leans on kyber crystals, not as a scientific mechanism, but as a narrative solution. Kyber stand in as limitless amplifiers, the story's shorthand for overcoming physics that would otherwise block the plot. And the storytelling goes even further. In Rogue One, we see the Empire strip mining entire cities just to secure crystal supplies. Symbolically, it highlights control of resources as control of power. Whoever owns the crystals owns the ability to destroy worlds. In reality, no mineral or material could scale that way. Even if you cornered all uranium, coal, oil, and lithium on Earth, you still wouldn't harness energy at anything like planetary destruction scale. That monopoly only makes sense in fiction. But if the weapon is impossible, what about the rest of the station? A moon-sized structure is still a challenge worth asking about. So, if a super laser needs star-scale energy, how could any real project ever look anything like a Death Star? Forget about unleashing beams of destruction. The deeper test is whether humans could even construct the outer shell of something on Death Star scale. The first version is described as roughly 160 kilometers across, and the second stretches closer to 200. To put that in perspective, the tallest skyscrapers on Earth push just over 800 meters, and the International Space Station measures on the order of 100 meters in length with a mass in the hundreds of tons. A spherical station hundreds of kilometers wide makes everything we've ever built look like scaffolding next to a stadium. That kind of scale immediately pivots the discussion toward mass. The ISS requires decades of launches and collaboration just to assemble a few hundred tons in orbit. For the Death Star, you're not talking about hundreds or even thousands of tons, but billions of tons if you only count a metal shell of minimal thickness. With today's economics, every kilogram to orbit still costs thousands of dollars even after dramatic improvements. Multiply that by billions of tons, and the figure surpasses the GDP of entire nations by orders of magnitude. Past a certain point, the number is so extreme, you can't even think of it as cost. It turns into reshaping entire economies over centuries. This is where SpaceX's current projects give us a hint of what might shift. Falcon 9, the company's workhorse rocket, can deliver just under 23 tons to low Earth orbit. Starship is designed to lift on the order of 100 tons per flight, a big step over existing rockets. Its intended reusability means the same vehicle could launch again and again 
which dramatically drops cost per flight compared to a fully expendable rocket. But even a 100-ton payload per flight doesn't magically render a 160-kilometer megastructure feasible. It only changes one factor in an ocean of challenges. If you imagine trying to assemble something planetary in scope, you would have to picture an endless procession of starship flights delivering modular pieces into orbit. Robotic or automated crews would then attach each brick into some expanding framework. The analogy works in the abstract, but the scale collapses under real numbers. The International Space Station, at just over 100 meters, took over a decade of careful assembly with dozens of heavy lift launches. To scale from a few hundred tons up to billions requires not a multiple of 10 or even a thousand, but several trillion by mass. Even under the most optimistic cadence, say daily Starship flights delivering 100 tons, the complete shell would stretch far beyond decades and almost certainly into centuries unless resources, political systems, or workforce assumptions were transitioned beyond recognition. Fiction fills the gap by handing the empire limitless infrastructure. Factory worlds turn out components in parallel, entire populations are coerced into labor, and fleets of construction modules swarm in orbit. The parallelism allows the fictional timeline to collapse into years instead of geological spans. But in our world, there is no plausible pathway to redirect the output of entire planets into a single project. Still, modern space industry already gives us an early picture of how scaled-up orbital systems might be managed. Starlink, for example, has deployed over 6,000 satellites into orbit, creating the largest constellation in history. Starlink already shows mass deployment at scale, proving we can design, launch, and coordinate thousands of assets with regularity. But note, those are spread networks, not a single fused megastructure. It demonstrates that modular repetition, rapid launch cadence, and industrialized assembly are possible, but only across distributed systems. Starship and Starlink show how economies of scale and distributed engineering can push the boundaries of what feels plausible, but they do not collapse the sheer difference between a megastructure measured in meters and one measured in hundreds of kilometers. And even if, by some unimaginable effort, the shell itself did take shape, a different challenge comes into focus. How do you keep something that large alive with power? Powering the impossible isn't about steel and scaffolding. It's about raw energy. Even if you could assemble a battle station hundreds of kilometers across, the harder question is where the power would come from. In Star Wars, the answer is simple. Kyber crystals. They function like limitless amplifiers, channeling and magnifying energy into a clean, perfectly focused beam. No wiring, no fuel logistics, no efficiency losses. Within the story, one giant crystal at the core neatly explains how an entire moon-sized station can fire a planet-shattering blast. But in reality, we don't have magical amplifiers. Every energy system we know is bound by physics, efficiency, and scale. Nuclear fission reactors give steady output without carbon, but they're heavy, complex, and bring risks from long-lived waste and safety standards. Renewable options are clean but distributed. They rely on conditions like sunlight and weather, which means they can't concentrate into a single directed flash on demand. All of them power homes, cities, or even national grids, but none scale to a sphere in orbit the size of a small world. This tension between fiction and physics becomes easiest to see when you look directly at the superweapon idea. The output of a Death Star shot is treated as equivalent to billions of nuclear detonations, delivered instantaneously. No real generator, reactor, or battery system could store or release energy anywhere near that range. In fact, the films drive the point further. In The Force Awakens, Starkiller Base literally harvests an entire star as fuel. It exaggerates what the Death Star was already hinting at. Only star-scale energy could ever reach those destructive levels. As a plot device, it raises the stakes. In physics terms, it underlines the absurdity. Containing even a fraction of a star's output is more impossible than the construction project itself. Science fiction does sometimes touch on related themes. A Dyson Sphere, the popular idea of surrounding a star with collectors, pushes the scenario all the way out to theoretical. A true Dyson Swarm would be so vast that even Earth's orbit would just be a tiny fraction of its scale far exceeding even the boldest megaprojects people discuss today. So what does this mean for powering something like a moon-sized station? 
The simple truth is that nothing we have today and nothing in serious forward-looking designs approaches that level. Our systems are human-scaled. Fuels, grids, reactors, and solar collectors for powering homes, cities, and industries. They don't step into the territory of planetary beams because physics and forces limit Star Wars ignores. No mineral, material, or mechanism will flip that switch for us. And that highlights the biggest gap. Star Wars fills the void with kyber crystals and star harvesters. We fill it with coal plants, reactors, wind farms, and solar panels. Their story is myth. Our story is engineering. One creates instant spectacle for film, the other moves step by step toward real advances. So there's no plausible way to power a Death Star style super laser with any known physics. But that doesn't mean large scale energy innovation is meaningless. It means we should ask a different question. Not how to destroy planets, but how to use energy to build at unprecedented scales. The real frontier is clear. What kinds of massive, positive megastructures are actually within reach? In the real world, three hard takeaways stand out. First, the super laser is impossible. Planet-killing blasts need star-scale energy we can't produce. Second, the shell itself would be unbuildable with current launch economics and logistics. Scaling from hundreds of tons to billions is beyond reach. Third, the only thing that does change the conversation is SpaceX. Starlink's thousands of satellites and Starship's 100-ton lift capacity show modular space infrastructure is possible, even if superweapons are not. So here's your turn. Which real-world project would you rather see? Orbital cities, giant solar farms, or asteroid manufacturers? Comment below, and if you enjoyed this breakdown, remember to like and subscribe for more nerdy comparisons that pit pop culture against real physics. Star Wars gives us a dramatic yardstick. It's impossible is written, but it pushes us to imagine the real engineering projects that could reshape life on Earth and far beyond.